thank you all, all for your interest in um, this program and in water conservation and in your community, because this is going to be good for the whole community, especially as we're going into a drought year. So what can you expect tonight? I'm going to describe the program, what it is, what it isn't, why we're offering this program. I'm just going to go ahead and answer that right now. We're offering this program and we're using um, conservation as kind of an in-town reservoir. So we know we can squeeze a little more out of the sponge and get more savings within town so that we can use it into the future and not um, be putting it down the river or flushing it down the toilet. So basically we're doing these, this program and I'm gonna talk about the pilot program we did initially, but we wanna see what kind of savings we can get what this program costs us, and is it cheaper than the city going out and buying more water? Um, the next thing I wanna talk about, and these aren't necessarily, the presentation isn't necessarily in this order. I wanna make sure that you understand what's required by city landscape codes, because the last thing I wanna do is have you take out your lawn and then you get a violation from code enforcement. So I wanna make sure that that's all clear for you. And I will be sending you some documents that um, our community development has provided to me so that you can make sure you're in compliance. I'm gonna talk about the criteria. So that's part of what is the program. I'm gonna talk about what Xeriscape is and is not. I'm gonna briefly go through the seven principles. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on design and probably not so much on the rest of it because the design is where we all start. So you gotta start there, have a good design or the rest of the pieces aren't gonna fall in place. I know this is kind of nervy. Um, some people may be nervous, they don't know how to get started. So I wanna talk about that a little, little bit. And then I'm gonna walk you through a sample design. I'm gonna talk to you about how to get rid of the existing turf and then um, what the benefits are to you. Okay, so one of the questions I get asked every single time I do a presentation about Xeriscape. I wanna do this, but my HOA won't let me. Well, here you go. Senate Bill 13, which was 2013, you'll see in the blue there, number 183 um, right here is the Senate Bill. Senator Carroll introduced and succeeded in passing legislation that prohibits your HOA homeowners association from enforcing covenants that limit zero escape, limit drought tolerant vegetation or, or force you to put in any amount of turf. So if they're telling you, you have to have blank percentage of turf, that is not true. So um, this is the bill and they went as so far as in 19 to even add a supplement to this that they wanna encourage in common spaces, um, more natural landscaping and less water thirsty turf. So um, if that is an issue for you, I still recommend if you're in an HOA, you run this by the um, landscape board in your HOA, but they can't tell you, no, you can't do this. And I am gonna talk about what's required by the city too. So this is the reality of where we live. This is what this looked like, you know, 150 years ago before we all got here. And we are putting an unsustainable landscape by planting bluegrass. And you can see there, there are no trees. So basically none of our trees are native, but we do have some really good choices for trees that can handle one, our alkaline soil, um, our compacted clay and deal with the dry climate. So, and that's what I'm hoping to help you with tonight. This is a pretty new program. We did a pilot project with just eight homes in 2018 and 19. And then we expanded the project last year. We did about 35, 40 homes in a couple um, commercial slash HOA projects. We have a goal to replace healthy watered turf. So I have to prove that this is gonna save water. So that's why it needs to be healthy and watered going in so that we can demonstrate savings. If you just have rock there now, or you just have weeds there now, putting plants in there is actually gonna show that Xeriscape 
goes up. So that's why I need to have healthy water turf. And then we're going to replace the turf with xeric plantings. So it's not putting in rock. That's not what this is about. And that will not comply with code. We will monitor the water use. We usually have to go about two years after install because there's a there's a period of one to three years where you need to get those plants adapted, get their roots to spread out. We call that establishment. So we need to give it, the plants enough time so that they can get established. But many plants, especially natives, you know, after that two to three years, they're gonna need no supplemental water or only supplemental water in years of severe drought. Last year, I also had them um, monitor the time and money they spent. So they do turn in receipts and we will require that again this year. That gives me an idea and I've got a slide coming up how much it's going to spend because that's the first thing, another thing people ask, how much is this going to cost me? So I want to give you some ideas of what you think you'll be doing, what you think you'll be spending. And then we want to initial or inevitably answer, is this a viable conservation program? So the basic requirements, of course, you have to be a city really water customer. I know that sounds silly, but because this is a webinar, I do get people from outside of the city. The lawn needs to be converted to xeriscape and it must be healthy water turf. I already mentioned that and I'll probably say it about five more times just so that I can drive it home. Right now we are just doing front yards, parkways and side yards. So it has to be side yard if it's visible from the, the right of way. It has to be visible so that one, we can see it and also you're gonna be kind of advertising for us so that people can go, hey, the Joneses did a really nice job on their landscape. Maybe we should do that. The other, the next thing, we want you to complete the project within the growing season. So basically we're gonna give you an answer if you're going to, if your project's a go in April or May, and then you'll have until October to complete this. I mentioned before, it has to be in compliance with city landscape codes. And we're asking you to convert 500 to 2,000 square feet of turf to xeric plantings or native grass. And I have some pictures of native grass coming up. The other requirement is we would ask that you commit to, and I know things happen, Commit to being, you know, if you if you plan on staying in your home at least five years. I did have in that pilot year um, a family that moved out at the end of the season, new family moved in, ripped out the xeriscape, put back in turf. So we would ask that you'd stay plan to stay in your yard, your house for five years. Is there a demonstration of the xeriscape I can visit in the area? We have a xeriscape demonstration garden at 2503 Reservoir Road. If you know where Centennial Pool is, it's just west of that and west of the brand new uh, fire station. It's about th three quarters of an acre. It's kind of a long skinny garden and you can walk through. Um, you know, I'll admit there's winter interest out there, but it's not like anything's in bloom. But, you know, check it out. At least familiarize yourself with it. Um, and then you'll know where to go in the spring and summer. So here's my slide of what Xeriscape is not. I mean, every time I still hear people go, well, I don't like rocks and cactus. Well, it's not rocks and cactus. It can be a beautiful, colorful, multi-layered landscape. And then this one, these obviously are palms, so this isn't local, but I was trying to find a picture of a rock yard. It's not just rock, and we don't want people to put in just rock. That creates heat islands, and that's a whole nother issue. So we want to have plants, but we want plants that use less water. Here's another couple pictures. I haven't taken the time to look at this property and see if it's in compliance with city code, but it, it can't be. There's way more rock and mulch than there are plants, and I'm not even sure that plant is one of theirs. So has to be at least 50%. This one, likewise, they have this big tree here. I can't tell if that's on their property or the next one, but this big sea of rock, that's not gonna fly and not gonna meet city code. So here's ex examples of how to use hardscape and rock and keep it attractive. They've got a little pathway here and they've got Veronica planted inside it, which softens the edges. 
They used a retaining wall. Xeriscape can solve problems. They used a retaining wall to plant on a slope and hold some soil back so they can have a nice display and tiered approach to their landscape. This one, they added this little walkway. So when guests um, show up, they have somewhere to land and get out of their car and then walk up to the front of the house. And then they put in this nice little island. So these are really good examples of how to use rock and hardscape right and not just put two tons of rock out in your front yard and be done with it. Like I said, it can be very lush. These are houses that were on the garden tour one year. This one on the right is a really pretty cottage garden. Um, very lush, very uh, English sort of or French. And then the one on the left is extremely Zurich. This couple that lived in the house on the left, they weren't home a major part of the summer and they didn't want to have to deal with mowing their grass, worrying about um, the sprinkler system. So they put in these plants that they basically said they water like maybe two, three times a summer. So, and it's still very lush. Again, they, they used rock, but they used it smart. They put a dry riverbed and then they have plants that soften it. Um, here's another one, not 50% live planting. And to add to it, every summer I see them put a sprinkler up here by the porch just spraying out here and it goes halfway into the street. And it's like, what are you even watering? These look like two elm suckers. They're not even trees that were planted there intentionally. And they're just wasting water. Now I get it, that's over by campus, so it's probably a rental, but still. Oh, there's a rent sign right there. <laughs> yes, it so, is. Here's another one that has even a little more rock than for my liking, but at least they have plants planted. So this looks like um, thyme, one of the thymes, woolly or pink chintz. This looks like ice plant. So they do have rock and it can be lower maintenance to do rock, but you do need to have the plants to make it attractive. Well, and again, to, to prevent those heat islands, when we talk about heat islands, we're also talking about your electricity bill skyrocketing. Um, what uh, these plants are doing for you is keeping the atmosphere a lot cooler down near the house. And uh, the more heat that you generate with these rock islands like this, um, a lot more energy needs to be used to keep you cool on the inside. And trees will help with that too. Everybody understands what it's like getting in a car that's been sitting in a hot parking lot. And you it's unbelievable the amount of savings in your uh, cooling costs and just comfort with trees. So again, I'm gonna say 50% live coverage. People interpret that as 50% turf. It doesn't have to be turf. Mm -hmm. It does need to be live plant material that is there 365 days a year. So. A vegetable garden in the front yard probably isn't going to cut it if it's your whole 50%. If it's sprinkled in with your 50%, it, it would. But doing a vegetable garden or just annuals is probably not going to cut it. Um, and I will be sending you a flyer that will help you calculate that and figure it out. But I'm going to show you real quick here, too. And I feel like I'm talking too slow, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit so you're not all dying. Let me check real quick. Okay. Uh, I did have a question. What if the entire front yard is not visible from the street? I'm on a hill. And again, um, I, I think if you email Ruth and uh, we can take a look at the property, we may be able to work something out. Um, Actually, yeah. So when you submit your pre-survey, We'll go through those and make those notes on there. The more information you can tell us on that, the more likely we are to, um, you know, talk, come and talk to you and see if we can make it work. Okay. Uh, I also have one. Is there any help with, uh, with your design? I'm not much of a designer myself. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to help a little bit with that today, but at the very end, I'm going to ask if a design class would be helpful for you. Yeah, and okay. uh, 
it, and if you're purchasing uh, through our Garden in the Box program, there's wonderful designs in there. That's can pretty much take you right through it. It's kind of like paint by numbers. Um, why does it say no plantings over 18 inches? In the parkway. Oh yeah, parkway. It's just for visibility because of yeah. your car. And especially see these triangles right here by your driveway. And you would probably have them over here on the corner. You need to be careful of those areas and not have too tall of stuff because you don't want to be backing out and hit a little kid on a bike. I mean, that would be the worst thing. So those are areas to be, um, you know, aware of. Yeah. These corners. A, yeah. Exactly. Go yeah, ahead. That was, that was the next question is, is corners of intersections. And yeah, same thing. Um, you, you want to, you don't want to blindside anybody. So you want to keep that kind of landscape low. How do you treat weeds? It depends on the weed. Yeah. And I've had Tina Booten come and do presentations on that. And she can tell you everything about that. She actually is on my resource list and she is the best person to answer that. Some of that, when we're take, when we do, when we go through taking out the turf, some of that can be addressed there. But when you have weeds within your plants, it gets a little more difficult. So I don't know whether you're talking about weeds now that you're going to be removing with the grass or weeds sprinkled in through perennials. So um, this uh, property also has this area like if there was an alley. So think about it, driveway, corner, alley, and think about that triangle of sight is what that's called. Uh, Tony, uh, somehow I, I lost your question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no, you, um, you, you, you can leave some grass in the front yard. That's not a problem at all. Work it into, into the design. Um, we're not looking to get rid of all the bluegrass, um, but uh, we're trying to change the aesthetic uh, to a more water saving feature. Um, it'll increase the value of your home. It'll save you money in the long run. And um, who likes to mow? Hope that answered your question. And I'm gonna show some pictures of people that did leave lawn or did native turf. So here's how you figure out how much you have to do. So measure your front yard length and width, measure your driveway length and width, and measure your walkways. And that'll give you an idea. You can add all the plantable areas together and then subtract out all the non-plantable areas, the driveway sidewalks. And that will give you an idea. Say it's 2,000 square feet, then you know that you need to have a thousand square feet of that covered. Okay, so here are the seven principles. Um, planning and design is the one I'm gonna spend the most amount of time on, but you see right here, it's create practical turf areas. One of the reasons why we're focusing on the front two, one, because it's visible, but two, kids aren't typically out there play, kicking a soccer ball around in the front yard. You know, keep your turf in the backyard where you're going to need it for kids and dogs. The front yard, you may not need as much, but again, it's create practical turf areas. It's not saying eliminate turf altogether. We understand that it is, you know, an aesthetic that people like. So selecting low water plants, using soil amendments, using mulches and I, my handout of resources, I'm gonna have a lot of this covered, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Efficient irrigation, that's Kevin's forte. He's the expert on that. And then maintaining the landscape. So why planning and design and why am I spending so much time? Because water conservation starts with a good design. A bad design wastes water, a good design has the potential for a lot of water savings. And you start with a good design, you follow through with it, you're gonna have a better looking landscape. You're gonna increase your curb appeal. You're gonna increase your property value. You're gonna have winter interest. You wanna have some height in there with your plants so that you do have that winter interest and you don't just have this flat grass area. Okay, so the good design coupled with the good irrigation, irrigation design construction and maintenance equals water conservation. So where do you start? Well, if you, in your um, 
paperwork from when you bought your house, you have this plot plan, that's a great place to start. If you bought your house so long ago, you don't have this anymore, I'm gonna show you how you can pull up a map on the city's website. Um, if it's just a small area, sketch it out to scale on graph paper. That's easy enough to do, especially if you're only doing the 500 square feet and you're just doing, you know, around the edge of the, the driveway or around the edge of the sidewalk. I like putting those transitional areas in between the turf and the hardscape. So if you do have a little bit of um, overspray from the turf, it's going into plants instead of on a hardscape. I would highly recommend drawing it to scale. One inch equals 10 feet or one inch equals 20 feet. Um, that'll just be easier for you to calculate and figure out how much area these, this plant is gonna cover. So if you go to the city website, it's up here at the top, greeleygov.com. The very first page, you see this area, you have jobs first and then maps. Click on maps. That takes you to this page. Property facts, click on that. That takes you to this page. Up here in the top right, I gotta move Kevin. I don't know if you can see me moving Kevin out of the way. <laughs> Up in the top right, punch in your address. It's gonna put a little pin at your house and then you can scroll in with these buttons. And then when you go down to the bottom of the page, it's kind of cut off here. You can see whether it's like this, which is the planometric map, or you can, um, do a combination or you can go to an aerial and the aerial will show you, oh yeah, I have a big tree there. Um, it might even show your fence line. And that is the way you can pull up a map. And then I would say, print it out, make some copies of it, and then start sketching on it. Or you could lay a piece of tracing paper over the top and do your sketches on that. But try a bunch of different scenarios and see what you like best. One thing I like to recommend is include pathways. And I'm gonna show you some um, nice pathways because that's a good way to carry you from the front door to the driveway, the driveway to the back gate, you know, around the other side of the house to turn on the water, whatever it is. You incorporate pathways and that's a good way to replace the turf and make it functional. Kevin, you have any questions? Can can you use sagebrush? I know it needs to be under 18 inches, but just curious. You could, and you could do that in your front yard. You just can't do that in the right of way. And That's if you're easy. doing right of way plantings, you do need to get a permit for that, just to keep in mind from community development. Um, this is one I thought about typing it up, but this is better to discuss for everybody. Um, are there low water turfs, and how much water can you save on average? That's kind of a large loaded question. I'm going to get there. If you can okay. just hold on for a minute. I'm and going to show you pictures too. In Russian sage, if you keep it shorter. Um, again, if it's in the right of way, I don't think I'd go with Russian sage. Um, and bear in mind that Russian, Russian sage is very invasive. So you got to keep an eye on it. So then start your design. So say this is your little map you've drawn up of your house. And you can see here's the driveway, here's your kitchen, your guest room, bedrooms, mark that on there. And then mark your existing things. So this is all the existing turf. These are all the existing trees. Mark those on there. Go out here at the driveway, at the front of the lot, on the corner and take pictures. And then don't forget about going inside the house and taking a picture out. The house I currently live in, they put like a big bush in front of every single window. And I don't know whether they didn't want people looking in, but I want to look out. So we've had to remove some of that. So think about while you're standing there at the kitchen sink, do you want to look out at a big wall of a shrub or do you want to be able to see what's going on at the neighborhood? Um, or if it's on the back of the house, do you want to be able to see your dog or your kids out there playing? So think about that too from the inside out. Um, I also recommend people kind of complement their architecture. If you have a Spanish type style house, there aren't a lot in Greeley, but there are a few, you might want to go with more of a Southwestern look. 
if you have a Victorian in Glenmere, you're probably going to want to go with a more cottage look, something that goes with the architecture. And I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I, these are just things to think about. So these are some hydrozones. So I know that might be a new term for you, but just think of it in terms of high water, medium water, moderate water, low, and very low. So your high water zone is going to be your cool season bluegrass or fescue. Your medium might be some of your perennials that use more water, like say roses or hydrangeas, um, some of those pickier plants. Moderate are going to be your, your perennials that are xeric. A low hydrozone, that's where you're going to get into with your um, native grasses and some of your native plants. And then this number right here is the gallons per square foot. You can see bluegrass uses about 18 gallons a square foot per year. You could get all the way down here, which is essentially half with your native grasses and your native perennials or some of the other things that aren't native to here but are very low using water. And that would be some of your um, really dry bunch grasses, um, succulents, things like that, ice plant, sedums. So think of it when you're sketching it out in terms of hydrozones. So here's a lot. The existing lot is all high water use. So the whole lot is using 17 to 19 inches. I realize that doesn't coordinate with the last one, but we'll get over it, um, over every square foot. So the next one, they kind of do a mix. So see, they left some turf, but then they use some medium water plants and some moderate water plants. And they've gotten the irrigation down to lower amounts. And so here's just kind of a sample of what these um, designs could look like with, see, this is existing grass and then shrubs, trees, and then perennials. So here's an even drier one. So they've taken out essentially all of the grass and they've gone to medium, moderate, and low. And this one's gonna save about 50% right here. And then this is what that design might look like. Um, if this must be planted with native turf now because it's lower. So this is the kind of sketching you can do. And you initially, you don't have to have all these plants drawn in. You could just draw a circle and say, this is going to be a tree and shrub bed. This is outside my kitchen window. So I want some um, really pretty flowers blooming here. This area, I want to block seeing um, my neighbors over there. They're ugly purple house or whatever. Um, so think about that. Just draw on there what you want to accentuate, what you might want to screen. And that's going to help you plan your design. Oh, this is the really low one where they have no turf. And this one's a 70% water reduction. Now remember this, we're just doing the front yards with this program. So that's going to be 70% over the front yard. That's not over the whole property. But if you have this very xeric in the front, then you can make your backyard look even better. So how will the properties be chosen? So we'll have you fill out a pre-screen survey and commit to the project. And we'll have you send some before photos and a drawing of what you want to do by March 15th. March 1st would even be better, but I'll give you till the 15th. So you have, you know, a good month and a half, two months to, to draw it out. And that helps you too, if you need to go to a professional to have them draw it out for you. In April, we will be making decisions and start visiting homes. So the person that said they didn't, the front isn't visible, that's when we'll come out and talk to you and take a look. Um, we'll narrow down the pool of applicants. Hopefully everybody that partic that does this can be involved. Um, if by chance we get way more applications than we can afford to do, we'll do it by lottery. So, but last year that was not the case. And I learned last year, people dropped out on me. So I'm going to bring in more than less. Um, but there is money 
I have about $100,000 to do this this year. So there's money out there. It's not like 150 people are on here and five houses are going to get picked. I'm hoping to do 50 or 60 homes easily. So what about HOAs, commercial sites, churches, small businesses, and other? This is Weld County Credit Union. They did 10,000 square feet. And this was kind of a swale, kind of their detention pond. And they completely redid it. So we will do 5,000 to 20,000 square feet for any of these um, non-residential properties. Now we are more limited on the amount we can do on those because it's a bigger number. But my boss did tell me that if we get a lot, enough interest, he'll find more money for this because we really want to make this a successful program. Um, on these bigger properties, we welcome partnerships. You know, at a church, if you can get all the church members to help put it in and save money, or you can get donations, or um, there is a Northern Colorado Water Conservancy. You would have had to have an application in for this year. But keeping this in mind, if it's a large project and you want to phase it over several years, you could participate in their program and use City Greeley money plus Northern money, put it together with your money and do a bigger project. Um, HOAs, if you're going to be doing it, you might want, well, you do need to make an appointment with community development. They always have a planner on um, duty for walk-ins or call and make an appointment, go in and talk to them about what you wanna do because they need to approve that. Okay, so that was the before and this is the after. And this is a picture we took holding the big chip check for $10,000. So they did this whole big swale. There's our little life after lawn sign. And then they did this area around the drive through So this is a good one to go look at. Um, it's on the corner of 47th Avenue and Center Place Drive on the south, no, northwest corner. I'm sure you'd recognize it as soon as you get there. Um, they really did a nice job. So how do I kill the existing turf? Uh, somebody wants to know how Xeriscape plants do with grubs. And um, from my experience, they're not an issue because grubs like water. But well, be and native plants, the reason why native plants are good is because they have natural um, resistance to things. And that's why you need less pesticides because they're adapted to grow here. So, right. yeah, I don't think you're going to have grubs like you would in a turf grass lawn. Are the garden in a box necessarily more drought tolerant? They do choose xeric plants and they usually have a native option too. So they are going to be more drought tolerant than turf. Just keep in mind, everything living needs water. This is not a no water landscape. Right. It's going to need some water. Open. And especially to get it started. So anticipate the first couple of years, you're going to use some water just to get things established. Uh, our HOA is considering replacing bluegrass with buffalo grass along a large section along 4th Street. Is this something that, that would be considered? Yes. Uh, we have a small apartment building. Can we participate? Uh, yeah, you certainly can. And um, again, just let us know. Almost every single one of these methods start with healthy turf. So if you're gonna do this and start killing it in May, you're probably going to need to water it and make sure it's growing in April when you can start watering with watering restrictions. So um, smothering it, you want to kill it. And in order to kill it, well, yeah, you do need it pretty healthy. Not as much as you do if you're going to apply a pesticide, but you do need it fairly healthy. Um, this guy right here, his name's Robert Patrick. He has some videos on YouTube. Uh, you might want to go look at those, but I'm just going to tell you, you can smother your lawn. You're going to do it pretty thick, and I'm going to let Kevin talk about that when we get to pictures of what he did. But you can use hay, grass clippings, sod, paper leaves, cardboard, newspaper. Um, I guess you could use a mended top or compost. Those two aren't on there, but you could use either of those as well. So basically what you're going to do is just do it pretty thick and just like putting the little kitty pool out there you know how it turns that yellowy green color and if you left it too long it's going to smother it that's what you're going to be doing this will kill everything so if you're only killing 
partial area of your grass, keep in mind, anything it drifts on, it will kill. So if you have the border where that guy's walking in that picture and you let it spray or it's too hot when you spray, it's gonna kill that too and it may drift to your trees. So keep it low. I would never have it that high off the ground if I were spraying a pesticide. You wanna keep it really low so it's not drifting and moving. Um, I have found that most people that are interested in this program don't want to use a pesticide. So we're going to give you some other options, but I'm going to walk through this anyway. Uh, this is broad spectrum, which means it'll kill everything. Uh, it's a pesticide. It has its risks. Read the label. That's your legal document. Read the label. Keep your kids and pets off of it until it says it's safe for them to go back on. Watch the weather report. If it's rainy, windy, or like I said, I wouldn't spray anything above 80 degrees temperature wise because it has a tendency to volatilize and drift. But the wind, rain, and heat, you, you really want perfect temperatures. And I find with these broad spectrums, you wanna do it early in the morning. Um, you know, you don't have to get up at five, but do it earlier, like seven, eight, nine. You don't want it to start getting warm. You're going to start seeing results in 24 hours, but keep in mind, it may take a couple applications. Make sure you wear protective clothing. This guy's got gloves. He's got long sleeves. He's got pants and those shoes. I have a fly flying around here. Um, those, the shoes you use, use your junky old shoes. Don't use the shoes you're going to be walking around in the house and spreading the pesticide around. You could even put something over your shoes like those little booties from the hospital or something to protect them. So that is using a pesticide. Okay, next one, solarizing. This one is a good one. You basically bake it. You bake the turf out. The problem is if you leave it too long, you can kill microorganisms. So this is clear plastic and I would recommend using about a four mil. It's a little thicker, so it's not going to rip um, when you put these bricks and things down on it. Use a little bit thicker one. I don't think you need to use six mil, but it, you, at least use four mil. It will kill weed seeds. It will kill pathogens. My dog just said hi. Nora, stop. You will need to weigh it down so you can see all these bricks and rocks and boards and things. I had a guy very successfully kill his grass this way last year. It does take a while though. And you do wanna make sure that you are not doing it for so long that you kill everything. You wanna keep those healthy guys in the soil, those microorganisms. This one, you do wanna water it pretty well because you want some moisture in there. That humidity is gonna help kill that grass. And then this is the most labor intensive, removing it by hand. So you can rent a sod cutter. And in this packet that I'm gonna send, I've listed all the people that can rent. I also have listed all the people that said that they will participate in this program and come out and remove sod. This is something that not every landscaper does because it is a lot of labor. So the people on this list have agreed to, um, come out and do your front yard for you. It does cost, it's a little more expensive than some of these other methods. And then you may still need this little tool down here to get, you're not gonna be able to get it right up to the edges of the sidewalk. So you may need to dig it or use this tool to get that out. Um, it is heavy, especially if the sod is wet. So, but it's really hard to roll if it's too dry. So you have to hit, hit that sweet spot but if you are physically challenged, this probably isn't the method for you. And I would say that's where to spend your money and hire somebody to do it. Um, hauling it away, sometimes they'll haul it away for you too, and that's included in the cost. But if you wanna build up some berms, you can leave some of it on site and flip that sod over, put the green part down and the soil up and build berms to create some um, elevation in your garden. Okay, hey, Kevin, you're up. Sure. This is called um, the G3 method. And basically, uh, a big part of it is, is taking the amount of uh, rainfall on your roof, that first inch over a year, and 
using that in your calculations for your water budget. Um, so we're actually retaining some of that, that first inch of water every time it rains in the landscape and allowing the rest of it to move off the property like it should. Um, what we're doing here, and it has to do with the smothering, this is my front yard. What I did, and this will address another person's question too about uh, changing out their sprinklers to, to drip. I did not. Um, this was all watered with, uh, with sprays and it still is. A lot of what we put in there was wildflowers. And so broadcasting just works better than trying to use drip for this kind of thing. So in this method, what we did is we, we dug a trench around the yard, um, only about a shovel's depth, you know, about six inches and about the same width. We used that extra uh, dirt and I made a couple of uh, um, berms just to basically give my yard some contour because they're really, it's just pretty flat. The trench is there to prevent that lawn from creeping out when you try and smother it. So that's really the reason it's there. So this is a good way to leave the sod and the organics on site. This is pesticide free. Like he said, he used that to reshape his yard. So the water will be retained in this area. And then these will be the taller, drier spots. Yep. And then it, we've seen very good success. And Kevin's going to talk about that in killing grass with this method. I was amazed. Uh, the method was first developed in California. And they, when I had asked that question, because being a, in the landscape industry for so long, rule number one, don't bury sod, um, because uh, it just becomes this concrete layer underneath. And so I was kind of concerned about that. They said it takes about a year to digest. Um, but uh, my experience was a little different. And I think it has to do with the climate here. So after we've dug the trench, we put out uh, just some, some decent compost. Didn't have to be a lot, just uh, it was about, I don't know, quarter to half of an inch. It was, really wasn't a whole lot. Um, got that all spread out and then we rolled um, contractor paper over. I just bought it at Lowe's. I think I, I used six or seven rolls. So it really wasn't a big amount of money spent and this is the inexpensive way to do it. After you roll the paper out and then you put mulch on top of it. You want a good three, four inches. Um, this thing they call the mulch burrito. Um, basically you roll the paper through the trench, fill it with the mulch and then roll the paper over it and then cover the whole thing with mulch. Again, what that really does is creates this barrier that grass can't get past. So as it's starting to smother, what it's gonna try and do is leave. And this prevents that from happening. So you don't have to deal with that. This only took uh, about two months to actually digest that sod. It disappeared. And, um, and I literally had the richest sod I'd ever seen. Um, this was really sandy soil. It was a decent loam, but it was phenomenal after that. And uh, I was able to plant this year. Um, I think in July, we started doing plantings and um, wildflowers, the whole shemil. And uh, it was very colorful, a lot of wildlife. We've got, uh, uh, hummingbirds nesting in our trees now um, through the season. I've seen baby hummingbirds. That's really amazing. And, um, you know, other types of wildlife, more birds than I've ever, different types of birds than I've ever seen um, are visiting now. And uh, again, this is a really inexpensive way to go about it and get that stuff converted pretty quickly. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. If you got more questions, <laughs> let me know. And that's the beauty of um, not having the monoculture of lawn is that you increase the diversity of the plants, you increase the diversity of the wildlife, the pollinators, yeah. all of those guys that, um, you know, produce our food and help make seed and make our flowers beautiful. So, okay, so I'm pretty close to being done of lecturing and I just wanted to show you a bunch of pictures of befores and afters. So this was a home in our pilot project. This was actually the second year. This particular um, property did this the first year, it was all lawn. And then this is what they did the second year. So this is 2018, this was 2019. So they probably over the two years, and this is a huge lot out in Rangeview, he probably reduced his landscape to maybe a third of the grass that he had before. 
And that's kind of what I tell people when I'm telling them how to estimate savings. If you do a third high water, a third low water, and a third moderate water, you're going to be looking at a 50, 50 to 60% savings. So you don't have to get rid of all the grass. You can see he didn't get rid of all the grass. Here's another property. They did get rid of all the grass. So they had a garden over here on the south side and then they took out the rest. They added these pathways. They got them down to the sidewalk and cars that were parked on the street. Um, and they just went with all, they did a lot of the garden in a box but then they supplemented with their own flowers. Here's a property of alternative turf. So I know this turf doesn't look that great because it was March or may, might have even been earlier when he took this picture, but it was, you know, healthy. And he replanted it with a Buffalo Blue Grandma mix. And this is his lawn after. And look at, it looks better than the bluegrass did. Granted, you're gonna have a shorter season of it being this nice green color because it's a warm season grass, it likes to it likes the heat. But if you're only watering at three and a half, four months instead of six months, you've got some savings there too. So here's what buffalo grass looks like. It's pretty short, only gets about four inches tall. Um, we're really recommending that people don't over mow the native turfs because it shades itself, you can see here. And that helps with the conservation of the water. If you keep mowing it and you mow it too short, it's going to expose more soil. And that's when you're going to get weeds. The longer you let this grow and the, um, you know, let it just do its natural thing, the less weeds you're going to have. I will admit, though, with buffalo and blue grandma grass, you're going to have weeds. And that's part of the establishment period is you need to stay on top of weeds because once you're you, you know you're establishing it you're putting water on it that germinates a lot of seeds so I just want you to be aware of that and know that that's going to be part of your regime you get past those three years and it's going to look significantly better so this is blue grandma it's a little bit taller grass this is the side of his house where he did just the blue grandma and he keeps it a little shorter on this side, but that's probably still six inch. And then here's if you don't mow it at all, it has all these really pretty seed heads towards August. And they look, they curl and they look like an eyelash. This is my favorite grass right here. I love this grass. But again, here's what it looks like mowed, not mowed too short. And this is if you just leave it. And it's gonna get about 12 inches, maybe up to 18 very rarely is it even all the way up to 18. And then here's another thing that's kind of fun. If you have a buffalo grass lawn, planting bulbs in it. So in the spring, it's not going to green up as fast as your bluegrass, but you could put bulbs out there and still have color. So this is a house in Greeley where um, they did this exact thing. They put their hyacinths and their daffodils in there. This is another alternative. This is a warm season grass, again, not a native. This is basically a Bermuda, a strain of Bermuda grass. Um, I was worried about it being invasive, but we've had it at the Xeriscape Garden for about three years now, and it hasn't crept out of its spot. I do recommend if you're gonna have these grasses and keep blue, um, bluegrass, that you separate them by something like a sidewalk or a driveway because they do tend to creep into each other. So this one is separated from the rest of the garden by um, a sidewalk. So this was June, this were, these were planted plugs and we did them one foot on center and they were about the size, they were smaller than like a two inch pot. They were about the size of a quarter when we put them in. And then by July, this is what they look like. You can see them getting bigger. And then August, you could still see the little mounds, but it's basically filled in. All three of these grasses do not like shade. If you have a hot, dry, southern or western exposure, these native grasses are perfect for that. These are not good for the north side 
if they're in the shade most of the day and they're not good under a tree. So keep that in mind. We replaced part of our lawn with garden in a box last year. Stepping stones and removed an aspen. Suggestions to keep aspen sap saplings down. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't like aspens on the front range. No. Um, Be here. You can spray them with certain pesticides that you can spray them. You mean herbicide? Yeah. But yeah, it's just a problem. It is. The largest living organism on the planet is an aspen tree. And so, you know, if, if you've got the saplings, guess who else does? Everybody in your block. Um, they're really hard to kill. And they're water hogs. Big time. I had one other question. What about planting clover? You know, we had somebody do that that was over by Glenmere. And at first I wasn't a big fan of that idea because I thought, well, it's probably going to use the same amount as um, bluegrass, but we're going to monitor it and see. I'm, I'm willing to give it a try. I think the micro clovers are probably what you want to do so that it has that finer texture. Again, I think you would probably want to separate it in an area where it's not going to be creeping into the neighbor's yard or other areas. Um, you know, back in the day, we didn't select clover out of lawns. In the 50s and 60s, every lawn had clover in it. Now people don't like it. So if you like it, it's fine, but you, you might want to be a good neighbor and make sure that your neighbors don't get mad. But I'm, I'm willing to try it if you want to try something. Give us a proposal. We'd like to see all different kinds of things. This is a big experiment that we're all involved in. Right, Kevin? Yep. We want to see what's going to save water and what isn't. Exactly. So here's some other alternatives that you might want to do. These are all great for around the stepping stones too. Um, it's snow and summer. This is up at the Xeriscape Garden. What I tried to do is we had some plants in there and they were um, seeding and they were getting tall and this is by the art up there and the art commission was worried they were clogging up the fountain. Didn't end up to be the case. The fountain is just flawed, but I went with a lower ground cover on the hill. And what I tried to do is mimic when you're looking at the mountains and you see those nice rolling hills and they get progressively lighter. That was what I was trying to do with my plants here. So I did Turkish Veronica and then two, actually two different kinds of Turkish Veronica. And so one's a little bit darker than the other and then pink chintz thyme. And they make a nice little um, ground cover. They are steppable. So if you do have stepping stones and they're creeping over, occasional walking on them isn't gonna hurt them. I wouldn't put them in an area where you're constantly stomping on them. I would make sure it's stepping stones if you have other places to walk. But all three of these plants are, you know, in a low traffic area, they're perfectly fine. I have some other plants over here. Plumbago would be a good ground cover in a shady area because it likes more shade. Um, not so much steppable because you will damage the leaves. An ice plant likes hot and dry. Um, I might add some in up here on this hill so that we have some bloom longer. Also, a little bit of traffic, but it is a succulent. So if you step on it, you're gonna squish its guts. So a little bit of traffic, but don't like, you know, have it in the dog run. So those are some other options. If you don't wanna do a lawn and you want some color, those are all very viable. And there's more out there. It's just, I just love these three together. So what's in it for you? A dollar a square foot. So if you take out 2,000 square feet, you're gonna get $2,000. Um, we, last year, Kevin put these drip kits together and we still have some. So you can purchase the drip kit. I think it's, it's $83 plus tax and that was our cost for it. So you get 200 uh, roll of, two rolls of 100 foot drip line and then all of these products. Do you want to talk about any of them, Kevin? I, I, yeah, I put that together two different styles of kits. One you can attach to the uh, um, to the lateral line that's feeding the zone, um, and and then just put your drip however you want. The other one uh, you can uh, cap off 
um, the heads on the zone all except for the last one. And it's actually a insert that'll screw into the head if it's a spray body and uh, it has the pressure reducer and an attachment right there. And then you can just run your drip. So either way is actually really easy to do. Um, and if you're doing a garden in the box, this, this will suffice. It'll get you all the way through it. Does about 400 square feet, depending on how many plants. Yeah. Um, then of course you get the $25 dis dollar discount on garden in a box. And those go on sale the first week of March. Um, I am working on discounts with vendors last year. I had uh, both Happy Life and Pope Farms did a discount coupon. Um, I'm not sure how much people really actually used it, but I'm gonna work on that again this year so you'd have those coupons. And then, like I said, curb appeal, property value, lower your water bill. Those are all good reasons to do this. And it's a sense of satisfaction. So you get the $25 discount. The pickup is May 25th from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Xeriscape Garden. We do do a fall offering. So you could order some in the spring and then do some more in the fall. Those go on sale in July, you know, if you wanted to plant later in the fall. They're nice big four inch pots. They're good sized plants and you will see growth this first year. And if you're really interested in creating pollinator gardens, cause they almost always have at least one or two pollinator gardens. All the plants are grown locally in Colorado. So they're not getting shipped in from California or Florida or some place that's not even close to our climate and they are neonic free. So you don't have to worry about the neonicotinoids with the pollinators. Um, what about rototilling to get rid of the uh, existing grass? If you are strong enough to do that, you just go right ahead. But I'm telling you, I've tried it and it is not easy. I do think you're gonna have more grass popping back up though than you would with some of the other methods. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't really kill it. Okay, so plant selection. This is our online plant database. We have about 300 plants listed in there with about a thousand photos that you can go in and look at. Um, Plantsforgreely.com. And it's, um, we're pretty proud of it. We put it all together, picked a lot of the plants. There's some good selections in there. You can go in and pick, I want a perennial that blooms summer to fall yellow and it'll pop up selections for you. Um, I want a tree that has a spring bloom, that kind of a thing. So go in and play with that. Another one I don't have on here, but it will be on your resource list is Plant Select and that's plantselect.org. They also have pre-planned designs in there that you can just print off and plagiarize. That's exactly what they're there for. And Plant Select is a program that's been around for about Oh, probably almost 30 years now. And it's a joint program between the growers in Colorado, CSU and the Denver Botanic Gardens. And every year they put about five to eight plants um, that they have been researching that grow well here and to, you know, just mix it up and create more diversity in our plant palettes because everybody has Russian sage, daylilies, coneflower. So those are some really good options at Plant Select that gives you, um, you know, different plants, really unique plants, and more and more um, garden centers are carrying them. So what is it going to cost? So I did some preliminary um, calculations, and on the low end, the person, the homeowners that spent the lease last year spent about a dollar and eleven cents per square foot. So if you get your dollar per square foot, then you're out of pockets 11 cents. On the high end, it was $6.83 per square foot. So in looking at their invoices, these are the things that are gonna cost money. Having it professionally designed, having it professionally installed, or doing a lot of rock work or walls, boulders, hardscape. So, this was one of the higher end ones with um, retaining walls. She had to do this because she had, um, well, she didn't have to, but she chose to do these tiers with retaining walls because she had a very um, sloped lot in her front yard. So 
looks really good, but just know that the more rock you're going to be adding, and sometimes she did all this herself, but if you're not able and you have to hire it out, that's going to cost more money. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what it might cost you. So here's another before and after. I'll tell you what, this couple warmed my heart. They had planted a couple of lilacs in their yard, but other than that, they were novice gardeners. And I'll tell you what, when I went to do the final inspection, they knew the name of every single plant in the garden. They bought um, the Durable Plants, which is the plant select book, or not durable, pretty tough plants. And they use that as a reference and they made plant lists and they went to the nurseries and the husband was totally against this. He didn't want to remove this grass. They did leave some in the front yard. Um, but by the end, he was a total convert. I mean, it just warmed my heart how much they were like, this is our new favorite hobby. So this is their side yard before and after. They had a little bit of a slope. So they put this little pathway and then they have these different beds. And the husband really got into succulents. So they did a lot of um, succulents. This is west facing and then the front of the house faces the south. And he did the succulents here and see they created a little landing space for, their, for them to get out and walk up to the house. And then um, it was just really cool to see how much they really enjoyed their project. Another benefit to this, and maybe it's COVID because everybody was out walking, but almost every single person I talked to said, I've gotten to know so many neighbors in the neighborhood because people are stopping by just to ask what we're doing. So that's really kind of cool too. It really does create some community. Oh, I remember those folks. They, they're one of the ones I dropped off one of those drip kits to. They did all that with one drip kit. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I've got somebody who was asking, uh, my HOA would rather pour more water on the grass. They think Xeriscape is putting in rock. They do not like rock. Uh, you know what? Um, you can get a hold of me. I, I talk to HOAs all the time, you know, to the boards and happy to do so. Um, and uh, we can, you know, do some education and, and, and show them a different path. That'll definitely save them money and in the long run, save you guys some money. So, uh, well, and once we have a couple of these um, HOAs that are doing this, then we can say, here, let's go look at this one. Yeah. Okay. This is another one. This gal, we actually let her do a little bit of her backyard because it was all completely visible. Over here, she had a chain link fence and it was visible to the public. So we let her do this little strip over here, even though it was behind the fence, you could see through it. So this was her front yard. She had some existing, and then this is looking at it from this angle. And she left, again, she left some turf. So you don't have to take out all the turf, but she put this nice pathway and these stepping stones and just really did a great job. This side, she really enhanced by putting more plants in there. It had a mixture of plants and grass. So here's another before and after. And I'm showing you these mostly to get you kind of excited. <laughs> this guy, this is a rental property. It's another big corner lot up by UNC. And um, he had to have a flood over on this side of his property because this whole hill sloped down towards the house. So we recommended he grade that. And then he put in this little uh, just rock dry creek bed to keep water from going in the basement. And so he created this patio on the left or on the right side, he created a little patio up here. He's gonna get um, furniture for the tenants. There's somebody that lives upstairs, somebody that lives downstairs. So they can sit out there and um, have a little patio. And then he did, I think, six garden in a boxes. And if you go to that Life After Lawn page, he did a whole PowerPoint of his project. Scroll down to the very bottom of the page, there's two PowerPoints. The one with the sloped yard, she turned her stuff in as a PowerPoint, and so did he. And it's really kind of neat to go in and look at what they did, because they did pictures all along. And um, he actually included his receipts and his design in there. So I think those would be good thing, good ones for you to look at. And these plants have grown by the end of the summer, they had already grown pretty, done pretty well. Um, so that one that I showed you where 
she did the pathway and we let her do a little bit of the back. This is what her design looked like. So it's not like super fancy or anything. She just kind of sketched it out and put it on paper. And just so she knew where she was moving with it, because it's so easy to go to the garden center and just pick a bunch of plants that you love and then get home and not know where to put them. And I am guilty of that. So um, it works better and you stick to your budget if you create a design, a plant list and try to stick to it. Of course, you're gonna find something that is, oh wow, that's really cool. But that's gonna help you stick to a budget. This yard was uh, a lot of grass and he did this between his and the neighbors, he went into the neighbors a little bit and then he added this pathway and he added a path up here to his backyard. And I'm gonna show you another picture of it up close because it's hard to really see when the house is so far away. And I cropped both of these pictures. This was his design. So he added this path, added the path here, put in a new tree, kept this existing lawn and built this new garden. This was the property line and he got permission from his neighbors and they did this part together. And this is what that area in between looks like. And this is on the other side of his driveway. So this is the south side of the house with the neighbor. This is the north side of the house with the other neighbor. And then here's his pathway to the backyard. This was his pathway in the front. This brick was existing and then he just had this come out to the street for people to walk up from the street instead of cutting across the lawn. So I'm showing you these because pathways are a good um, way to draw the traffic and reduce water in those areas. All different kinds of products. He used these stones. This, this is a different house. He used these stones so that if people were cutting through the garden, they weren't stepping on plants. So that's pretty simple. Uh, this is that one I showed you before from that other angle. She, these are actually little rubber um, stepping stones. And then this is like a gravel. And these um, look like little trees, like you cut the trees. This is flagstone. It's a good path. And then she's planted little plants in here that will eventually soften all these edges. Here's another one you can do with just those 12 by 12 stepping stones and add some art to it. So all of these are just to kind of get you going, motivated, see some ideas. Um, this is that sloped property I told you about. This was actually a city employee and this is what she did when she got furloughed with COVID. She did this garden and um, this wall was here but she built all the rest of this. And this is what it looked like towards the end of the summer. See, she did no mulch, she did all rock. But once these plants are all filled in, there's not gonna be an issue with um, a heat island because it's gonna be shaded by the plants. And these plants that she selected are all so xeric that if she would have used wood mulch, it would have been too rich for them. Um, I think this is my last one. So this whole piece was taken out, again, pathways. He had a dry riverbed, which he built um, a little walk, went over that dry river bed so that if there was water in it, you wouldn't be getting muddy and then did this entire side of his house. A lot of these folks originally said they were gonna do like maybe 1500 and then they were like, no, nope, I'm taking it all out. So a lot of them expanded their projects. So that was kind of fun too. And they really were excited to show it off. Um, this is another woman, I don't have after pictures of hers, but she paid somebody to do this design. This is what another design could look like. So you can see how you have it sketched out or they have it drawn out in the garden, but then over to the right here is the plant list. And it lists out, it, I can't read it, but it probably even has the size, you know, five or five gallon, two gallon, four inch. The smaller plant you put in, it will grow but if you can get it in a smaller size, two benefits. It's cheaper and it's easier to dig the hole. All right, so I know I went over my time. I'm sorry. 
I'll be emailing you some materials. Um, I'll have you fill out that pre-screening survey and have you send us pictures. And I realize you're not gonna be able to get pictures now, but maybe by March or some people last year gave us pictures off of Zillow or something like that, um, or a street view from off of Google. Those will all work. We just wanna have a before and after and then return the information to us by our team, start doing the visits. The goal is to have all the projects chosen by May and give you the go ahead on install. And then checks are cut in the fall or whenever you get it done. If you get it done in July, you you know, and submit the stuff, you'll get paid in July. What is Garden in a Box? Oh, I guess we didn't really get into that. Okay, so there's a nonprofit over in Boulder and they do this program called Garden in a Box. And you can go online and look at it, although they probably don't have the gardens in there yet. They may. Um, it's resourcecentral.org. We basically pay them an administrative fee and they put these, they have designers design these gardens. They contact the growers, the growers build or grow the plants, put them together. And so when you get, when you go online and buy your garden, you'll go online to their website and pay for it. You get a $25 discount when you put in that you're a Greeley Water customer. And then you will get, um, when you come and pick it up on May 25th, you'll get a flat or two flats, depending on how many plants are in the garden. And it's, you know, by size and by money, one flat's going to be cheaper than a two flat garden. It'll tell you how many square feet it covers. It'll tell you the characteristics. There's always a couple suns at least. There's usually one shade, sometimes a native. And like I said, there's almost always one or two pollinator gardens. And they're those big four inch plants and you'll get your plants and you'll get a planting plan and it may have one to three different um, scenarios of, or designs in there. So if it's gonna be viewed by two sides, you know, they're going to have one design. If it's a corner, um, and you don't have to follow the designs, but if you're really worried about designing, that could be an easy way for you to, you know, dip your toe in the water. Um, and then you get that along with your plants on May 25th, and then you get to go home and start planting. And a lot of people really have taken um, advantage of that program. We've been doing it for oh, almost 10 years, I'd say. And I bet we've sold, well, we, we sell, I, I do the contract for 160, I think a year. So we sell quite a few of them and some people buy more than one. Could you show some low water grass types? Sorry. Oh, I showed those with the buffalo and the blue grandma and the- um... Dog tough? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, of the three, I, you know, I would say the dog tough is gonna give you the green you might be wanting. Um, the others are not quite that green. Uh, it's more of a um, a light green. Right. The dog tough and the dog tough, I would say don't ever mow that one. It's only about three inches tall and it's kind of cushy. It's a nice soft grass to walk on. Um, and I found that when it got mowed, it looked worse. So you don't even need to mow that one. No, nope, just let it go. Um, I may need to contend with shaded space to meet the 500 to 2000 foot requirement. Can you resource, can your resources help with that? Yes. In fact, I have um, Amy Lentz, who is a extension agent. She and I talked about doing a class for dry shade. So that would be the class for you to come to. And I haven't gotten all my classes lined up, but I'm going to get on it tomorrow. Um, also, I started to say earlier, did I tell finish this? The G3 method, I am actually paying the people out in California to do two classes on that method of smothering the turf and creating a rain garden to keep the water on site and take advantage. I know it doesn't rain that much in Colorado, but if you do, did get a half inch or an inch of rain and you could keep it on site in your garden, that's going to make a difference. So um, I am going to have them do a couple classes and I'll be getting those all posted here pretty soon. So three more. 
Uh, so how much is it to hire a designer? And I could say that really depends on the designer. Um, it's a professional service. These guys have certifications and um, degrees and, uh, you know, you're going to have to pay for that. Um, and a so designer is going to be a little less than an architect. Keep that in mind. An architect yeah. has a lot more in um, engineering and education a designer is going to be a cheaper way to go but they're gonna they can both get the job done sorry i butted in no problem uh does point number eight on this screen mean you should have five perennial shrubs per 100 square feet yes and i put that in there this year because i had a couple properties where they removed the turf but because of their existing trees they just put in a sea of mulch and I kind of want to avoid that. So, um, and this is something I learned from someone else's program. I'm going to say five perennials or shrubs. It could be less it, depending on how big the shrub is per hundred square feet, just so you don't have a big, big sea of rock or mulch. And there is some living plants and that's going to help you get to that 50%. But a good design, that doesn't mean every, inch needs to be covered with a plant, a good design is going to have a good combination of a cluster of plants here, maybe some rock or some or a boulder or some walkway. Um, that's just kind of a guideline just to make sure people aren't just putting in mulch. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Not previously knowing about this program, I already started a Zurich remodel in our front yard last summer. Can I still qualify for the program? Um, that would be one with, we'd want to probably look at your consumption and do you have before and after photos or before photos? And I would still probably go ahead and fill it out. And I mean, we will try and work with you if we can, and we have the resources. Um, cause I'd really like everybody to be able to do this at some point when they're ready and have the inclination. And I don't remember who it was that asked uh, about uh, seeing the finished product on my yard. That's my background right now. You have to forgive, it's not really popping all the colors that were there because of the smoke during the summer. So it kind of bleached out all my photographs. But um, yeah, it turned out really well. Um, I had no idea there were that many species of bees, really didn't. There are over 900 species of native bees in Colorado. Yeah, it's amazing. There's so many. And that's not even honeybees. That's native bees to Colorado. If you choose to use rock, are there any suggestions on larger river rock or smaller rocks, etc.? I kind of like in the dry creek beds, the bigger, the four to six inch cobble, especially along the edges. Um, it depends on what you want to use that area where you're putting rock, if you're gonna be walking across it, it's a lot harder to walk across those bigger boulders and you might wanna size it down. If it's gonna be along the sides of a pathway and you're gonna do stepping stones, I would do a smaller like even breeze or a squeegee or pea gravel in those areas because that's just a more comfortable area to walk. Um, if you have a dogs, I hear the pea gravel gets in between their pads so unless you have stepping stones in there, that might not be the best thing. And maybe a two inch cobble would be better. So it really depends, but like the plants being different sizes and being layered and this is taller and this is um, moderate and then coming down to a low for you know visual interest, you're gonna wanna vary that maybe a little bit with your, um, your rock too. If you have different areas that are gonna be used for different things. Does that help? I hope, I know you can't answer me, but. That was a great answer. All of these things, and the more information you give us, um, you're gonna really sell this project to us. So I would love it if I could say, everybody's gonna get picked, but I'm afraid as this program gets bigger and bigger and more people know about it, it's gonna be more and more competitive. So, Tell us as much as you can, and we're gonna we're gonna try and at least do a little something for most people. 
But um, these are all things, you know, if you want to create habitat, those are good selling points. And having the plants in layers and visibility is really big, but like the one person that said their front yard isn't shown. Well, it may not be visible, but if there's two or three others in your neighborhood, maybe that's not as big of a deal. Um, that's another thing. I'd really like to get some of these out um, in some of these neighborhoods. I would say I have most of them in the 11th Avenue to 47th Avenue area. So I'd like to get some more on the east side of town and on the west side of town, far west side, so that I can basically, I would like to see at least one or two in every neighborhood. All right, you can always get a hold of us at conserveatgreeleygov.com. And Kevin and I both have our, um, our the last part of our email is greeleygov.com. I'm Ruth.quaid. He's Kevin.hartley. All right, thank you and have a good night.